I want to thank the organizers. I also <clears throat> want to tell you that uh, every one of my talks, and you'll get tired of seeing me since I've been vested with four, uh, has a picture of Kentucky. And with rare exception, I suspect that uh, none of you have been to Kentucky. Uh, one of the best kept secrets in the United States, by the way. So uh, the first talk is on the outcome of drug-induced PML. And you can't talk about drug -induced, the outcome of drug-induced PML without looking at the history of PML. And I've divided PML into three epochs. The pre-AIDS epoch, the AIDS pandemic epoch, and now the monoclonal antibody era epoch. And by outcomes, we'll talk about morbidity and mortality. So this disease was first identified as an entity in 1958 by Astro, Mankel, and Richardson. It was reported in this issue of Brain, uh, the cover page you see on the left-hand side, and they described three patients. Two of them were elderly individuals with CLL, and one was a man in his 40s who had Hodgkin's disease. They were all dead within four months. In fact, both the CLL patients were dead in four months. The patient with Hodgkin's disease lived 10 weeks. Between 1958, when the disease was described, and 1984, when Ben Brooks and Duard Walker collected all the cases they could find, both published and unpublished, a total of 230, um, of which 69 were pathologically confirmed and only 40 both virologically and pathologically confirmed. What they found was that 80% of individuals with PML were dead by nine months of disease onset. In fact, the mode of survival was well under three months, as you could see on the right-hand side. They did, however, find individuals that had these unusually long survivals, five years, 10 years, 19 years. The longest virologically proven case was six years. So there, there, there were outliers for survival. Now, the patients that they had in their series were very different than the patients we see currently because at that time, recall this is 1984, AIDS was described in 1981, and by 1984, there were only five cases in the world's literature of individuals that had HIV-associated PML. So these were the diseases that they found amongst those 230 patients, almost two-thirds of whom had underlying lymphoproliferative diseases, for the most part, B-cell malignancies. 6% had myeloproliferative disease and so on. The, of those 16% with immune deficiency disorders, only 2% or thereabouts had HIV infection. And these are some of the representative examples of those patients with prolonged survival. So I, I only show you this because what's so interesting is, is that one person had no identifying underlying risk of disease, another had non-tropical sprue, and two of them had perivascular inflammation, which is not, a, at that time at least, wasn't considered a typical component of the pathology of PML. How did it change with HIV? So we've now moved to the HIV epoch, and that epoch can be divided into two separate groups, those before the availability of highly active antiretroviral therapy and those after highly active antiretroviral therapy. And if we look at the pre-heart era, what we find is that the mean survival is 6.4 months, but the median was two to six months and the mode only one to two months. Now, the reason that the mean is so far out there is because a small percentage of patients could live a long period of time. So we found that about 10% of individuals would live greater than one year, and that caused the mean to expand out towards the right. In the post-heart era, the mean survival is 8 to 15 months, and survival greater than 12 months is 38 to 50 percent. I show you this as one representative example of an individual with HIV-associated PML who had a prolonged survival. Gene Major knows this patient very well because 25 years ago, I sent him and a few others up to the NIH for Gene and Sid Huff to study since I found it so perplexing that these people were doing so well. 
And this was a 39-year-old man who had some fatigue and depression in April of 1985. He was a waiter on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and he started thanking his left hand for helping him clear the table. He had what we call in neurology an alien hand syndrome. And he went over to the Massachusetts General Hospital to be seen. There they found that he had some weakness of the left side. He, his hand would move when he closed his eyes because he wasn't quite sure where it was in space. Uh, and they proved that he was HIV positive. And the CT scan you see is, recall this is in the days before MRIs, the CT scan you see was his CT scan and it showed contrast enhancing lesion, rim enhancement. So what was that? Uh, by definition, back then, we'd say, oh, that's toxoplasma, an AIDS patient with a ring enhancing lesion. He was treated for toxo. He didn't get any better. They ultimately biopsy him. Who read the biopsy? E.P. Richardson, Jr., the same guy who first described PML. Uh, and he was sent home to die. He weighed like 90 pounds. He was very weak on his left side. He had a hemisensory deficit. He had a monomous amyonopsia. And he started getting better and better, and better, and better. And I didn't do anything to him. His family would bring him down from Central Florida to see me like every three months. He was only on one drug, Dilantin. This is in the days before AZT was available. And he just got better. Uh, and the only thing he was left with was a little diff difficulty tapping his left foot. And when sent to the NIH, the only thing they could find, actually, they didn't find virus anywhere in bone marrow in spinal fluid and blood, but of course, this is in the days before PCR. And he ended up dying 96 months later, but not of PML. He died of lymphoma. Um, what about PML in the monoclonal or clonal era? Um, we have drugs that I define as those that uniquely predispose you to PML, such as natalizumab and ephelizumab. That is, the, they will give rise to PML in the absence of an underlying disease that puts you at risk for developing PML. And then there are those drugs that seem to increase one's risk over and above that that occurs from the disease which you are treating. So drugs like rituximab will seem to increase the risk, but the patients that receive rituximab for the most part are individuals that have some sort of risk for PML to begin with because of the nature of their underlying disease. Um, so, this is the data with respect to PML uh, with natalizumab. As of July 5th, as you heard from Christoph, there have been 145 cases, uh, post-marketing cases of natalizumab-associated PML among 83,300 exposed patients. The overall risk of PML has been estimated to be 1.62 per thousand, uh, with confidence intervals narrowing uh, every month with the reports down to 1.37 to 1.91 per thousand, and 29 of the 145 have died, so 20% mortality. A preliminary data from 79 cases collected as of December 2nd, 2009, showed that 63 of the 79 were alive, and 38 of the 63, with uh, having greater than six-month uh, follow-up, um, had the following in terms of disability. 13% had a mild disability, 50% a moderate disability, and 37% a severe disability. And disability was defined by the Karnofsky scales. So uh, 80 to 100 is mild, 50 to 70 is moderate, and 10 to 40 is severe. And for those of you unfamiliar with the Karnofsky performance status scale, this is what it is. 80 to 100 implies that the patient is able to carry on normal activity and to work with no special care needed. 50 to 70 is that they're unable to work, but they're able to live at home and care for most of their personal needs with varying amount of assistance needed. And from zero to 40, they're unable to care for themselves uh, and often require institutionalization or hospital care. So based on the first 79 post-marketing PML cases, what is learned is the following. There are predictors or seem to be for favorable outcome. They include a shorter, shorter time from symptom onset to diagnosis, uh, 27 versus 41 days. So the earlier you catch the disease, the better off the patient's going to be. The younger the patient, the better they seem to do. The lower uh, their disability scores at the onset of the illness, the better they seem to do. And if the disease is confined as opposed to widespread in their brain, 
on MRI, the better they seem to do. What isn't a predictive apparently are gender, the duration of their MS, how much natalizumab they've received. So it didn't matter whether they got 12 months, 24 months, or 36 months. Uh, the use of prior immunosuppressive drugs, now that increases one's risk of developing PML, but doesn't seem to increase their mortality. And the CSF-JC viral load at the time of diagnosis, which is in contradistinction to what we see in the HIV population. Now, this was shared with me just last week uh, by the folks at Biogen, and I thank them for the help that they've provided in preparing my talks. Um, it turns out that, and this is counterintuitive as well, it didn't matter in terms of survival whether patients got plex or immunoabsorption or not. So it seems, although, and the numbers are very small, that uh, whether you get plex or not, uh, didn't change survival. Ephelizumab, it's very difficult to talk about because there are only three confirmed cases in the world's literature, all of whom died. So I have little to say about that. There's a very nice article in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology that addresses those three uh, cases. Uh, deaths occurred between seven and a half weeks to six months in those three individuals. Likewise, it's difficult to talk about rituximab because none of these drugs have been studied to the same extent that natalizumab has. On the other hand, uh, you can draw some information from the paper published by Carson and from some other sources. And what they did is looked at the research on adverse drug event and reports. And uh, between 1997 and 2008, they were able to identify a fairly sizable group of individuals that had developed PML in association with rituximab treatment. Almost all had these underlying diseases that increase one's risk. Most importantly, lymphoproliferative diseases. That was 52 patients. Two had been treated for SLE, one with rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. Uh, most had received concomitant therapies, uh, including stem cell transplants, purine analogs, and alkylating agents. The median time from the last rituximab dose was 5.5 months. The case fatality rate was 90% with rituximab. And the median time to death was two months. There was no consistent anti-PML therapy in the survivors, and you heard from Gene, and I will reiterate, to date, we have no effective antiviral treatment for PML. So to conclude, you could really break down survival of PML into these various epochs. You have that of the pre-AIDS epoch, where the disease was virtually universally fatal with some rare outliers that had this long-term survival. Many of them displayed this perivascular inflammation. When you go back and look at these case reports, and many of them had diseases that weren't typical, things like tropical sprue or no under underlying identifiable disease. You have the AIDS epoch, which you can divide into two separate groups, the pre-heart and the post-heart. In the pre-heart era, the survival is very much like the survival in the pre-AIDS era, that 90% fatality. Whereas in the post-heart era, with the restoration of the immune system, you find long-term survival that approaches 50%. And I will talk more about this, by the way, in my next talk on the immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. And then you have the monoclonal epoch, which is 2005 to the present. And really, the only good data we have is with natalizumab, where survival approximates 80%. What we could say is the following, that the outcome is, in large measure, predicted by the nature of the underlying immunologic deficit. If it is reversible, there's, you can affect survival. If it is not reversible, uh, then you're stuck. For PML that's due to a reversible immunosuppressive condition, such as monoclonal antibodies, it's important that the PML be detected early, and it's important that the offending agent be immediately removed. As for the future, one must rely on the development of effective anti-JC viral therapies, and perhaps remyelination agents that might help uh, remyelinate the brain. And I'll leave you with this thought from Yogi Berra, the Yankees catcher. It's tough to make predictions, especially about the future.